so this is James Hunter, and he is going to be talking about the future of content marketing, advanced client segmentation, and personalization. He is the CEO of a company called Scaffold. He is very new to wording, so we need to be extra nice to him um, as a new person to our lovely town. And we actually met at one of the Worthing Digital Socials a few months ago. So please welcome James. Hello everyone. Uh, so firstly, thank you Denise, that was very interesting. Um, quite, quite nice to hear your view on long form content being good because that's kind of our view as well, uh, from Scaffold as well. Um, now what I'm going to talk about today is personalization. Um, so it's more of kind of a view to uh, building an audience, kind of not really what the, the, the talk today is about, it's about kind of how you might personalize your content to reach your audience in a different way that might kind of impress them or kind of make, um, make them feel that you are actually worthy. And I'll try not to lose the crown. <laughs> so I expect you wondering who I am. Well, my background is process and service design. Uh, I did that for about 20 years, both as a client and agency side. I've heard both of those kind of things, spoken both sides of those of the coin. Um, there's some of the companies that I've worked for. I'm doing this thing. Excuse me, this is my first time I've done this talk. It was kind of arranging it last night, kind of on the fly. So uh, I'm going to try and race through it. Um, I was made in London seven years ago for the fifth time. Thought, screw that, don't want to do that anymore. So I set up a company. Scaffold, these are the clients that we've kind of had over the last seven years. Um, but that's enough about me. Um, so we're going to talk about the main event. So this is the running order today. Um, we've already done the intro and thanks. So we're going to talk a little bit about what personalization is, the 101, what does it mean. Uh, I'm going to go into kind of how you might build a personalization strategy. We've kind of developed a methodology and a framework over the last few years that can kind of help you execute a personalization strategy. And finally, I'll sort of cover how content fits into the mix. This is, after all, a content marketing talk. So, what is personalization? Well, quick Google search, personalization, personalized marketing, maybe about 302 million results. That's quite a lot of content. It's a bit of a buzz phrase at the moment, lots of people talking about it. Um, as a way of comparison, another thing people are talking a lot about at the moment is blockchain. So about 280 million results for that, so a little bit ahead of blockchain, but kind of not too far away. Um, and this is the kind of trend in search volume. So over the last five years, it's got better. There's more search volume, there's a bigger audience. People are going to be writing more and more content as we go there. So with so much personalization, how much of it was actually hype? Well, you may be familiar with something called the hype curve. So this was developed by a company called Gartner. And it's a rough model intended to kind of illustrate how people's expectations of kind of new technology evolves over time. From innovation, where nobody's heard about it, through to hype, where everyone's saying it will solve all of your problems, um, to the inevitable disappointment, when people find out it doesn't, uh, and then where the actual use cases stabilize and get to the point of equilibrium where people are kind of getting what they expect out of the promise. So Gartner, who invented it, do a, a hype curve about marketing technology. So we'll go back to 2016. And you'll see we are here, which is great news. We're in the slope of enlightenment. The hype curve has burst. Everybody's kind of got over their disappointment with it not delivering. We've got a blue dot there. So go on to think in two to five years, the, mature, the, the technology will have matured and we'll be on what's what they call the, pro, the plateau of productivity. So if we fast forward three years to today, hello, welcome to the future. Something's wrong. We've gone backwards. Personalization is now back into the trough of disillusionment. Um, so... If we put aside the fact that the hype curve itself should probably be at the top there of their own hype curve, um, and if we ignore their somewhat questionable methodology for deciding where things live on the curve, um, I think we can say for sure that personalization hasn't really delivered on its promise. That's kind of what's caused this kind of drop into the trough of disillusionment. So what was the pinky promise? Well, local businesses have always been pretty good at personalization. Uh, they've been personalizing for their kind of their regular customers. Um, the owner's happy to have a chat with you when you've gone in, you've kind of bought something, he's remembered you bought something. Next time you come in, I'll maybe show my age a little bit here. I think now it's not this guy, it's, uh, it's David Jason for Open Online House. So the promise is uh, that the, kind of the way that the local business owner will have known about you and kind of been able to make recommendations and understand a little bit about you and kind of what you've bought in the past, um, the promise of personalization technology is that using data and kind of automation, every business can deliver that kind of level of personalization to every customer and can deliver really kind of solid customer experience. So really it's about kind of scaling up really, really good customer service and delivering it to all your customers without spending a fortune on kind of loads of kind of customer service consultants, etc. 
particularly if you're an internet business, that's quite important. You don't have the opportunity to have those kind of one-to-one -one relationships. So back to some stats. Uh, now, the research indicates strongly that any business that kind of delivers that kind of personal touch um, will be kind of more successful. And I'm not going to go into these stats here. They don't lie. Um, you can look at that uh, link later. I'll share it with everyone if they want. You can kind of go into a little bit more detail. But it's clear the research is con conclusive. People that do it well kind of get a benefit from it. But if people are doing it well, why is everybody so disillusioned? Well, I think to answer that word, to answer that inner word, data. Or rather, I think the root cause of poor personalization, the uh, root cause of the disillusionment is poor personalization, of which the root cause is poor data. Um, so obviously, if you've got bad data, you're going to be targeting poorly. Um, it's a, a, a very rewarding or kind of encouraging to know that even the bad guys, even, even the big guys don't do it well. Um, and as any military tactician will tell you, executing a plan based on, I'm maybe showing my age again here, um, but any executing a plan based on bad data is going to be worse than doing nothing. And personalization is no different. This is looking quite a lot of uh, personalization fails. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, so in order to improve personalization and deliver upon the promise, we need to think about the data that we've got and we need to think about how we're using it. Uh, so, so that segues neatly uh, into the next section, which is really just about a kind of framework that we've come up with and a methodology that we've come up with that will kind of help you work out what kind of data you have, how good it is, and what to do with it in order to drive better personalization and kind of better customer experiences. So as I said, effective personalization is about data. So more specifically, uh, well, so a personalization strategy is more specifically going to be a data strategy. So it's about how your business collects and stores, importantly, interprets what you've collected and stored about customers, and how you then do something with that analysis. So before we continue, I just wanted to cover AI quickly. A lot of people may have seen a lot of hype at the moment around personalization engines, AI-driven stuff. All the vendors will tell you if you plug our artificial intelligence into your website, analytics, you know, you'll make loads more sales, blah, blah, bang, bish, bash, bosh, profit. Well, who knew vendors are probably over the pudding a little bit. The reality is the intersection between your business, your kind of services you provide and products you provide, and your customers is going to be unique. It's a unique context for your business. So that means that the data you collect and what you do with it and kind of how you analyze that also needs to be unique. And an AI kind of needs to sit within a framework that makes sense for your business before it's going to deliver you value. Don't get me wrong, I, for one, will welcome our robot overlords when they finally arrive. But it's safe to say they're probably not here yet. So much as a train needs tracks, AI, or probably to be more specific, machine learning. They need a lot of well-structured, clean data that's organized in a sensible way in order to do the learning before they can actually deliver any results. Now, as it starts to, starts to learn, and it can do some kind of interesting and useful stuff, uh, much like a baby, it needs constant feeding, and it needs a lot of attention. Uh, without that constant attention, everything ends up covered in poo. Now, uh, recent experience for me with both a baby and AI, so I've talked from experience. Um, so what I'm trying to say is there are no shortcuts. AI can't solve the problem of kind of chaotic, unorganized data. You're going to have to do that for yourself. And to be honest, you know, whether you plan to use machine learning or not, going through the process of organizing your data, your customer data, and kind of working out what's sensible and what's not is you know, it's the first step to being you know, effective business, let alone doing an effective personalization. So what does a customer framework, data framework look like? Well, as luck would have it, there's one there. Um, we've developed this methodology over a few years with a few clients. Um, to help kind of clients kind of build and kind of understand their customer data and kind of build a personalization strategy and a content strategy that might come off the back of that. So it's based around this pyramid model. And we start with raw customer data. Now your customer data is basically a fact library, everything you know for sure about your customer. Um, or your prospect, it doesn't have to be a customer. So it could be any one of these, it could be all of them, it could be none of them, it could be some of them, it could be different ones. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, it's going to be different for each business as well. You know, some of these kind of things won't be available to some businesses. You know, other businesses will have more uh, and different metrics. The important thing is the data has to be real, so it comes from an actual customer. Um, it has to be reliable, so ideally you've verified it, or at least you've kind of assessed it as likely to be reliable data. And you can assign all that data to an individual. And again, that individual doesn't need to be a customer. It could be like an anonymous web user. But the important thing is don't double count data items and don't put the data for one person in another person's bucket. Now, most organizations will keep all this kind of data in different silos, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You don't need to keep everything in one place, in spite of what some vendors might tell you about their integrated customer data platforms. But, and it's a big but, 
the more connected your data sources are, the better. Um, if you can accurately and quickly answer the question, what do we know about this customer? How many times have we had contact with them? That's a good thing. If a computer can ask the question of your data, uh, because it's well structured, by which I mean it's in a database and not sitting in email, or not sitting on a Word document on a file server somewhere, all the better, because then it can do something with that automatically. That's when you can get really sophisticated in terms of how you personalize and how you kind of deliver really impressive customer service without spending a fortune on customer service reps. So um, you don't need to connect everything up though. Don't kind of feel that this is kind of scary. Um, in fact, it's probably impractical for quite a lot of small businesses particularly to connect all this stuff up. Um, so if you think about the most important sources to connect, you want to connect your customer data, your CRM system, you want to try and connect your sales system, so kind of what they've done, what they've purchased off you, and if you can, the web data. So your, uh, your analytics and um, CRM and sales together provide you probably with 80% of the connectivity and the data that you're kind of interested in looking at. But of course, the raw data doesn't tell us everything uh, about customers and it doesn't really tell us much that's actionable. So for that, we have this second layer, which is your attributes. So attributes are made by taking the raw data and running them through some kind of calculation that makes sense for your business. Um, they should explain or predict some kind of behavior um, that's relevant to the business. And you should be able to answer questions that you ask of your customer base with the data that comes from an attribute. So what that means in practice is things like this. So again, it's not a complete list, uh, and, but it should give you an idea. My recommendation would be to start simple, with simple metrics that you can pull out of your data quickly. Uh, but as you start to kind of experiment and query your data, you'll probably start to find kind of more complex ways of sort of asking questions of your data, uh, and you'll be able to pull out more interesting facts. And eventually you'll reach a black hole where you can't answer a question because you don't have the data, which will give you an idea of where you should go next in terms of your data strategy. So if there's something you want to know about your customers you don't currently know, then you can ask your web analytics people or your developers if there's a way you can capture that data and you can make a call about whether it's cost effective for you to invest the time and money in doing that because you know, if it's worth it then you know go for it so that's your kind of business case there's your strategy in terms of evolving your data and kind of the more you play around with your data the more questions you ask over time you'll build a kind of body of insight about all your customers that's kind of super valuable and what you're supposed to do within that data in order to drive personalization strategies is kind of look amongst it for patterns and that's where segments come in. So once you have a pattern in your data about individuals, you can kind of group them up. You can't strategize at the individual level. Segments are about strategy. So the job of a strategist is to kind of predict trends, broad trends, and kind of allocate resources accordingly. So analyzing your attribute data in this model will allow you to tease out broad patterns of behavior, and segments will provide you a way of kind of prioritizing your resources <coughs> on those customers that are going to deliver a better value. Now, a simple segment could be generated by asking <coughs> the data about a single attribute, something along the lines of segment A is everyone with an attribute of Y that's above or below a certain value. Um, that's quite simple, um, but it does have its uses. But the real power comes when you start to combine it with more statistical analysis and other segments. Now, as individuals, we're not as unique as we think. Individuals behave in broadly similar ways, and the data that tracks those behaviours will form clusters over time, particularly your analytics data. So statistical analysis might enable you to come up with segments like this. Now, typically, this might seem quite complicated, and it might be if you've got lots of data, it might be the job of a data scientist, or this is maybe where an AI would come in. Most SMEs, they've got small enough data sets, you could probably get away with doing this with, you know, slight understanding of maths, an Excel spreadsheet, and kind of get involved. You'd be surprised about how much insight you can generate from the data you've got available. So notwithstanding how you do it, once you've come up with some smart segments like this, and you combine them with reasonably straightforward segments to talk about uh, each customer's kind of financial value, you can start to build a kind of strategy about how you might respond to different kind of queries. You might say, I'm going to target this particular, um, this particular segment with some price changes, because you understand what their price sensitivity is, or you might do a channel or strategy reach out, um, do a channel or category reach out strategy. So by going through the bottom to top, we can make sure our data is accurate and it's accessible. Uh, we calculate the attributes for each customer. We analyze our attributes over time to build these strategic segments. And then we have a data model, and that presents kind of a deep strategic uh, resource that you can use um, to kind of analyze questions about your customer base and set your business strategy accordingly. So once you have that understanding, <coughs> what do you do and how is that personalization? Well, we try and bring it to life by going back down the pyramid. So once we understand who, so we've got this kind of crossover between these two types of segments. 
we've got an understanding of our kind of businesses' financials in customer terms, which is more interesting, I think, often than the financials in terms of product performance or category performance. After all, customers are the people that give you all their money. Um, so if we know which customer segments are underperforming and our more sophisticated segments give an idea of what marketing levers we might need to employ, we know who to target. So what's next? Is we can say for the sake of argument that retention of our top customers, so that 10%, uh, is our goal. And obviously we've decided that we're worried about retention. So what we can do uh, is we can kind of analyse the data the attributes and work out what our churn risk is. So we analyse our data and we find that a strong early warning of churn is a drop off in web traffic <coughs> for a given customer. So now we have a churn risk attribute. So we can look at our top customers, identify who the biggest ones at risk of churn are, and we can come up with some strategies and tactics and you can test them uh, in order to uh, kind of try and kind of re engage them. So we're going to come up with a re engagement tactic. Um, we have to have an average customer change, one of our best customers, let's say. So we know who I am, uh, I'm one of the best customers, I know what I suspect through our analysis of data that I'm at risk of leaving, so we can develop a re-engagement strategy, and this is where the lowest kind of tier there, the foundation, the raw data comes in, because we really need to kind of optimise our kind of re-engagement email using personalisation to make it as effective as possible. So uh, we've got a choice of either doing a discount or loyalty points for the re-engagement strategy. Uh, we know James has spent his loyalty points. Uh, he's quite responsive to that channel, to our kind of attributes. Uh, we know that he's got 150 points left in his account through the raw data. So we're going to go, in his case, we're going to send a retention email. We're going to offer him 200 points, take him over his threshold, uh, but only if he makes a purchase over £30. But in the email, we're also going to put in some product teasers for a bunch of products that cost just a little bit more than £30. Uh, we know what his favourite category is, so we're going to select all those products from his favourite category. Um, but we're going to filter out things we know he's already bought. Now, we've got some ordering choices too. We can order the teasers by popularity. We could order it by reviews, stars. Uh, we could be, if we're a little bit more cynical, we could order it by how much profit margin we make on each product. Um, or we can make it on how much inventory is left. We try to ship some stock. So that's kind of personalization on steroids. You have to take the strategic objectives of the business. You kind of analyze the trends within your attributes. And you use the personal data, the specific data about the individual to tailor your approach. And the more kind of automatable that is, the better you can kind of deliver that customised service uh, kind of at scale without having to sort of think about every single customer individually. So you're probably thinking, what's content got to do with that? Well, if we look at content strategy, and this is kind of a more commercial content strategy than perhaps uh, you were talking about, but typically many content strategies will map content types to various stages in the customer journey. Now I think a better content strategy you recognise that customers have goals, whatever that goal is, could be signing up to a newsletter, could be becoming a client, it could be making a donation to a charity, or it could be you know, a pure commercial goal of selling a product. Customers all have needs towards the goal, and good content strategy will consider the needs and map the content themes, not the content types, the content themes, so what the content's about, to the customer's needs at each stage in their buying journey. Now, a world-class customer, uh, a world-class content strategy will have multiple of these maps because each map has to refer to a specific combination of kind of buyer, buyer persona and products. So the more complex your business is, the more kind of maps you need. Many SMEs will probably get away with two or three maps, maybe two or three personas. So I think most people understand that content and personalization are kind of intrinsically linked. You take what you know about a customer in order to decide what content to show to them. So far, so obvious. But what may be less obvious is that the content people consume, and when, particularly if it's long-form content, tells you a huge amount about what they're thinking. People don't spend the time and effort to read something if they're not interested in the topic. So you know what their intent is if you can map what they're consuming when to a particular customer journey. So if you can track that data and associate it with a particular customer, you can kind of enrich your customer data with some really useful kind of information. It's a very strong, <coughs> it's a very strong indication of where they are in their buying journey, which is, from a marketer's perspective, gold dust. So, from my perspective, takeaways there, you need good data. You need to analyse it for trends. You don't need to start big. Think big, but don't start big. And content isn't just an output, it's also an input. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, that was quite dense.
a little bit nervous. It's the first time I've done it. Apologies, but yeah. Thank you for Hello. Hello. Sorry, I'm on the post. Hello. Um, you said the most important ones to start with were the analytics and the CRM. Yes. How do you connect those? Like, what are you trying to match up there? Well, so if you have all the web activity of an individual, which you do in Google Analytics, it kind of keeps everything by sort of session, you have individuals. Usually it's anonymous data. What Google allows you to do within your analytics, and it's something you can kind of talk to your web dev team, it allows you to inject into the Google Analytics like a, a unique code. And if that unique code is the same as a unique code you have in your CRM for your customer, you can actually tie what customers are doing. If they've logged in, you can tie everything together. So that gives you a really rich data source, and it allows you to kind of bridge the gap between that kind of web stuff and what people are doing. Uh, I mean, it works for e-commerce, works for everything, really. As long as you've got a website and you've got, ideally, you want somebody, you want a website that people can log into. So it might be something where there's gated content, or it might be something where it's an e-commerce or something. But if there's a profile of some description, or you know who they are, maybe they've signed up for a newsletter or something like that. If you put a profile in place on your site for those users, you can identify and you can tie all their data together to their customer record, which is really valuable. If you then, because then you can sort of see what content they're reading, particularly if you've got quite a rich, kind of deep library of content. And it's all structured in a kind of strategic way to kind of support their needs. You can infer what they need from what they're reading, which means you can infer how you treat them, or how you deal with them, or how you encourage them to do the thing that you want to do, which whatever it is. Are you manually analyzing the data? Or is this uh, software that you have? Uh, so you need to store the data in some kind of data source. You need to build the queries and kind of put the layers together. But once you've kind of define the model, you ask the question, you put the model in place and then it's automated. Ideally, as you add kind of models, questions, attributes, the system will kind of dynamically calculate those attributes either weekly, monthly, or it might do it kind of on demand so that it's always real time. The more real time, the better, because obviously if you're going to react to people in real time on the web, you need to be pretty fast, you need to be able to add, store, process, and analyze your data pretty quickly. So the analysis, it can't be done automatically. You need to put that framework in place. Once you put the framework in place, you can either do a bit of kind of query, querying in kind of Excel or whatever if there's not much data, or you can maybe pass it to a data scientist if you don't have one on your team, or you might, you know, might use an AI in that instance because AIs are pretty good, but they're very good in very narrow use cases. So if your use case has been narrowed down by your data structure, putting an AI at it, and there are quite a few kind of reasonably um, cost-effective AI solutions out there. Amazon do a whole bunch of things. So to do the processing in bulk. You couldn't do that manually, but you have to come up with the kind of, you have to ask the questions you're interested in as a business. And that's the kind of starting point for the whole kind of, uh, kind of analysis piece. And then after that, it should be as automatic as possible and you're just optimizing, adjusting, adding little bits over time. Because there's this kind of data set and the relationship between kind of data at a point in time and data points historically, that builds up your kind of insight over time. And what sort of minimum numbers you need to start getting good at that predictive? Because um, 200 points to me sounds like a Tesco's. But if I work with a smaller business that has. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean you, you, wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to bring kind of uh, uh, loyalty points into it, right? So you wouldn't need necessarily to have loyalty points. That, if you did have them, that would be a really useful data source for kind of how. It's just a channel, right? So at the end of the day, a loyalty scheme is just a kind of a marketing channel and it's a kind of it's a way of kind of generating insight from your customers. If you don't have that, then you, know, you can personalize in other ways. Um, how long it takes to build a picture, it's kind of how, you know, how long is a piece of string. It kind of depends on the complexity of your business, depends on how many questions you're interested in, what sort of customers you have, kind of how broad your categories and product selections are, kind of what your web presence is, how many kind of visitors you have. All of this data, you know, the fewer data points you have, the easier it is. But there's a point at which it's no longer cost effective to do an AI because you might as well do it yourself, right? <laughs> because, and, and you have a more intimate understanding of the kind of knowledge of the customers. So it really it kind of depends, really. But, um, it's worth investing in some analytics consultancy, I would say, initially, if you're kind of trying to think about how this would work, because uh, the kind of if you, you know, your digital consultancy should be asking you the kind of questions that they need in order to set up your analytics framework appropriately for your business. That's a kind of the standard starting point, I would say, for any digital consultancy should be, okay, how am I going to work out if this has succeeded? And that's where your analytics framework comes in. There are any other questions? Um, you can catch James afterwards. Are you your your slides were really very very good and very detailed. Are you happy to share them? Mm, so yeah, sure, sure. Share them because people might want to look at them again. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Right, right. Cool, great. Can thank have my you notes so as well much. if you want. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you.